Uh, today I will talk about my studies during my PhD. Uh, the topic is formation of topological defects in liquid crystals. So if you are, my talk will be um, divided into two parts. The first part is um, the formation of topological defects around topological collides. I will explain everything about what's, what are liquid crystals, what are topological defects, what are topological collides. And in the second part, uh, I will show you um, the early stages of my work on the formation of topological de defects after rapid cooling. Uh, let's go into it. So what are liquid crystals? So liquid crystals are basically, uh, like everybody says, um, it's another state of matter. It's a state of matter between solid and liquid. So it has some properties of a solid phase. Like here, we have a solid phase. It's completely solid, uh, periodical structures, everything is ordered. Um, and here is a, a perfect liquid, so everything is random. But in liquid crystals, we have two, two things. We can have translational order and orientational order. So translational then means that we are on the, we can predict from one position, we can predict the next position. Orientational, we can say we are a factor of how they are oriented. So in this, because we have this ordering and this order parameter, uh, this, the liquid crystals are um, biofringents, and that's why we can work with them in a lab field. Um, biofringents, that means that uh, if we shine some polarized lights through them, they, they basically uh, retard the light and we, we, it changes the polarization of light. And that's why we can detect them. For instance, in my work, I, I use a lot of uh, polarization optical microscopy, which um, where I use cross polarizers, so those are two polarizers which are crossed, and if no sample is in between, it's completely dark, but if you put liquid crystal in between, mm, you uh, perceive some light to them, which is, that's why we use this method. So what are topological defects? Basically, topological defects are areas um, in the liquid crystal structure where the, 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 the orientation cannot be defined. So I will talk only about orientational ordering. I will not talk about translational ordering because we use pneumatic liquid crystal and where translational ordering is not um, the dominant or is not present at all. So here you see basically a normal a standard picture of a liquid crystal under cross polarized microscopy. Uh, the colors are due to the retardation of light through the polar, uh, to polarizers and the dark patches are basically the areas where the molecules of the liquid crystals are oriented in the same direction as the polarizer. For instance, here the polarizer is like this and so the mo molecules uh, in the dark place are oriented towards them. And these small spots, which are indicated as pink spots, are basically areas where the orientation cannot be defined. So they're called topological. We cannot remove them from the system. So yeah, uh, we can characterize them in different ways. One simple true dick cross section uh, characteristic characteristics is the binding numbers. So we can basically count around how many times the liquid crystal orients and in what way does it orient around the defect. So for instance, we have plus minus one and a half defects. So uh, the defects can also form around topological, uh, some uh, colloidal particles. Colloidal particles are basically particles with the size of like, let's say 10 microns, which are placed in the liquid crystals and they enforce their own ordering. So if you see here, this particle is placed in liquid crystal, the liquid crystal wants to be like this but the particle introduces a defect, basically its own defect, because the on the surface, the liquid crystals want to be perpendicular. And that's why in the middle you have a defect. So the system compensates by producing its own uh, topological defects with a different charge, or in this case, winding number. So this is, can be characterized by um, different particles characterize different topological defects. For instance, if you have a genus, um, let we, if we talk about shapes uh, in geometry, we can talk about um, genuses in, uh, basically genus is a um, term for describing the number of holes in the, uh, in the particle. So this is genus zero, it has no holes and it creates one particle. This is genus one, uh, it has one hole, you can transform it without cutting, uh, only it, it always has one homeless. That's why it uh, it will produce two defects, uh, but the charge would be zero. 
And this can be described by this Gauss Bonnet theorem, which basically describes the, the shape. It connects the shape, which is the Gaussian curvature of the liquid of the shape, to the Euler characteristics, which, which is the number of holes. Sorry, did you want to ask me something or what was this interruption? No? Okay. No, no, sorry, you can go ahead. Go, you can go ahead. I can continue? Yes, you can, okay, continue. Will... You can continue. Okay, so as I said, you, uh, you have different genuses, genuses of uh, shapes. For instance, here zero, you have a total charge of one. Here you have a shape which are similar in topological terms. They have genus of one, so they have one hole, and we predict zero, zero charge. So this is the work which was done in uh, Boulder, Colorado by some collaborators, and they showed that if you put uh, a toroidal particles inside of liquid crystal, you get two defects. One defect is here at the edge, and one is in the middle, or you can have one in the edge and one in the inner edge. And in a different orientation, you can have different combinations. But this is always the, the topological charge stays the same. You can add or subtract uh, defects, but they will always the total number will um, be connected to the shape of the particle and nothing else. It's, it's that simple. So what, did, uh, what we did in 2015, we placed a long fiber, which has a genus of zero. So it has only one defect. But we placed a lot of, uh, with optical tweezers, we created areas where we can have double. So if you add um, defects, you can add them plus and minus, plus and minus, so the total charge remains the same. So you always have to add pairs. So next was um, what we wanted to do is what we wanted to see, okay, let's, how does geometry place uh, go into this picture? So we have here the topological uh, charge, and we want to see how the char charge changes with, uh, Geometry. That's why we create, we have a um, special device. It's called a two photon polymerization printer. It's uh, basically a 3D printer which has a resolution of 100 nanometers. So basically, you have infrared light which is focused on um, polymer, basically a monomer which. Uh, which absorbs in the UV spectrum, but not in the red spectrum. So if you shine the light inside and you uh, focus the light enough, you can basically create an area where two uh, photons can be in the same spot at the same time, and basically have UV light. And this, you can move this voxel around and you can pick um, print structures. And then we plasma clean them to activate the surface, and then we um, put some alignment agent on top, which is in our case silent, which uh, enforces strong homotropic anchoring, so the molecules are like perpendicular to the surface, and we place them in a liquid crystal. So this is a SEM uh, um, uh, electron microscope uh, picture of my particles. So these are five layers. So this is 500 nanometers. One of these layers, this line is 100 nanometers thick. So it's really, really, really thin, and the particles are 20 microns by 10 microns by half a micron. So they are, but they are still stable. We put them in a liquid crystal, and we want to study how does the ge the geometry affect the number of topological defects. So the geometry in our case is fractal. So we want to see if the fractality goes into the number of defects or anything. So what's fractal? Basically, you take this. We take the shape, this side. It's divided into three three spaces, and we take the middle part out and we make it a triangle. So we repeat it and repeat it and repeat it. So it's self-similar. You can go on different uh, size scales and you see the same pattern. So every time you see a triangle. So we went from zero, one, two, three orders of um, fertility, and we tested their, um, what's happening in liquid crystal. For instance, let's take the simplest case. Yeah, so this is uh, the, the Koch fractal of zero duration inside of a liquid crystal. The orientation of liquid crystal is like this, and we see these dark patches are the locations of topological defects. So you, we will, we know that from the um, genus, the total charge or the total total winding number sh should be zero. But we see three pairs. We always see them in pairs. There are three pairs of um, topological defects which cancel uh, each other out. So we have two preferred orientations inside. Um, on this simple 
of uh, zero iteration, uh, which can go, if you increase the complexity of the fractal, you can already go to 28 to 24 pairs. So we basically found a scaling law, which, um, which connects the number of topological defect pairs, they have to be in pairs, to the fractal iteration. The iteration is the number of triangles, basically. Um, and we see that it's uh, a power law. So this was published in uh, Nature, Nature Communications in 2017. Okay, so next what we tried is uh, we asked ourselves, okay, we saw the shape in fact in, um, impact the number of topological events. Let's see if the correlative, so basically if, if we do, uh, in, if we introduce some rotation in the orientation of the liquid crystal. Um, rotation, that means basically we just put something which is screw-like, so it rotates in one direction. Okay, we put the same topological um, uh, Toro, tori inside of liquid crystal here in the, in the planar cell. So in the planar cell, the uh, defect is one around and one in the middle. And we want to see what's happening inside of a chiral liquid crystal. Because if you put this inside a, a spherical particle, you see in no, no, div, uh, no twist is uh, a circle. If you introduce some twist, the lines follow and they can wind around. Okay. So we repeated this with toroidal particles and we saw here, you see that the winding goes around and we can see it's one connected line which turns all around the particles. It goes here up and then down under the particle and the total charge remains the same. It's a charge of zero. It's the same in these two cases. Okay. So yeah, what we do is how we test this. We put the particle inside of uh, the liquid crystal. We use optical tweezers. We first hit up around the cell to the higher um, or uh, the lower order state. So it's an isotropic state and then quench it, rapidly cool it, which resets the structures. And uh, after some time, only the stable structures remain. And with the tweezers, we can test and probe. We can move basically the um, defect and we can test um, where, what's the orientation and the charge of the particles. Here it's also, yeah, in, we can, we, if you apply an electric field, we can produce basically a rapid unwinding of the, of the defects, which basically makes them jump out of this. This is still unpublished work, so I don't want to talk about a lot. So the second, let's go to the second part. Now I talk basically to the static formations of liquid crystal uh, topological defects, which were around topological particles or around some induced by particles or by geometry or by chirality. So um, let's not talk about dynamic processes. If, for instance, if we, uh, we have a simple liquid crystal um, at the phase transition temperature, you have two minima, which correspond to two different phases. Here is the isotropic phase, here is the nematic phase. And if you cool it down slowly, you, can, you get to a point where only one phase is stable. So here is only the isotropic stable, here is only the nematic stable. So that's what's happening in, um, if you go really slowly. So it's almost static. Um, and you can produce a, a super cooled liquid crystal, which is undercooled for one Kelvin. So, but what can, what can you do? You can go, so you can imagine liquid crystal, basically the thermal fluctuations can jump them from here to here, from here to here, from here to here. So what's happening if, for instance, you can go so fast to the phase transition that, uh, that the, the, this minima drops so fast that, um, that a jump from this to this state is not possible anymore. So it's, this phase is still stable after some time. So this is called the uh, kibble jurek mechanism. Basically, you, you heat up or cool, in our case, you cool the, um, cool the um, uh, system through the phase transition and the system responds to a certain time. Uh, but after some, uh, and it's completely adiabatic, but at some point, the the changes in the, the enforced changes are so fast that the system cannot basically interact. It cannot um, um, catch up to the changes and it freezes. 
And this freeze, freeze state is called the impulse regime, and it's uh, frozen through the phase transition also in the lower symmetry phase. And this time here, this time is called the Jurek time. And this was uh, shown in uh, different um, different uh, systems from um, early stage formation of the universe, from Big Bang to helium to other states of uh, of matter, basically. So yeah, in this case, you will um, forget about these numbers. That's just cool. So yeah, it was uh, in liquid crystals. It was seen in um, with pressure quenches in really thick cells in the early nineties. But the huge problem is the the um, in the Kimber Jurek mechanism requires extremely fast phase transitions, phase transition rates, so cooling rates. But um, oh, but th those you produce like three hundred kelvins per second or something like that. It's equivalent, um, which is much easier to produce in like uh, um, helium or in here in Bose-Einstein condensates and something like that. Uh, but in theory, it's possible so far. But the theories are really advanced in this field, but the uh, experiments are really, really, really lacking. So what we require is basically an experiment which can provide us with cooling rates of the 10,000 Kelvin per second. So not 300, but 10,000 Kelvin per second. So we did this. So what are the challenges? Yeah, at least 10,000. Kelvin per second, and uh, if you want to see what's happening at these fast cooling rates, you have to have an uh, imaging system or a detector system, which un uh, allows you to detect changes in the microsecond or the nanosecond range, so gigahertz, um, which is extremely hard because camera equipment is uh, uh, has a lot of readout time um, readout time issues. It it takes some time to read data. It requires a lot of light. In this short amount of times, it uh, adds up. It requires a lot of time, and um, it requires a lot of light to image anything. So this video that we're showing right now is uh, captured with a normal camera. So this first image is the where everything is uh, a circle. You see the formation. Uh, it's an isotropic cell, which is uh, isotropic state of liquid crystal, which is produced by um, optical tweezers. And then, if you as you cool, the, uh, shut down the tweezer, the liquid crystal cools down, and you see these weird uh, lines forming. Those lines are basically the later stages of the Jurek mechanism, where um, um, topological defect lines form, and then they annihilate in the vacuum. So what we want to see is want to see what's happening in the first. Uh, between the first and the second frame. And this is already imaged at, uh, I think it's 10 microseconds from one to another frame. So it's really fast already. But what we did is we took a, a laser for illumination because we need a lot of light. But uh, the la uh, laser has uh, two problems, basically. And it creates coherent light which is a problem if you image something which is uh, which scatters you want to see you want to see basically the changes of polarization in your image but you don't want to see the interference patterns because of those changes so what we did we used a fluorescent dye we sh shine the light of the laser it is a hugely powerful um, i think it's 50 50 joule laser or something like that or millijoule yeah 50 millijoule laser uh, which we shine into a cuvette of fluorescent dye, which basically creates a short pulse of 20 nanoseconds at, uh, without uh, a short pulse of light without any um, coherence, so or extremely short coherence, um, which we then feed into our uh, microscope and we image our um, our sample with this. After we, we use one laser to heat up the sample, we use a really, really thick layer of ITO, so in the titanium, uh, titanium uh, in the tin oxide film, which uh, acts as a heat sink. And we heat, um, so with this thick layer, we, we enable really, really fast quenches, so fast cooling rates. And with uh, this um, orange light, we, we can image everything with 20 nanosecond 
time resolution. So what we can only produce one of these uh, pulses per experiment because still the readout time cannot be eliminated from the cameras. But because this process is random, we can uh, repeat this process over and over again and we produce an image or basically a movie of the, of the process itself. So this is basically the, the, the main part of this experiment. You have green uh, light, which is pumped into the tube, and you take the from the edge. You take the the fluorescent light. You don't want to take it from the bottom because it's super powerful, and still the green light can burn your camera. So this is the spectrum. It's it's a wide spectrum. It has no lasing lines anymore, and this is the pause duration. Yeah, you see here some ringing from because we, it's super fast. It's twenty nanoseconds. Um, yeah, so well, this is the image we produce. As I said, we make, we heat up the sample, we rapidly shut down the laser in two, uh, two microseconds, and then we wait an image at, at certain amount of time. So because this heating was done fast and the cooling was done so fast, the system is frozen for some time from here to here. So here in this case, you see it starts from, because it's a Gaussian laser, the heating laser, here is hot and here is colder. Um, you see the formation of defects at the edges, not the, at the center. But what you see here is, I also calculated the temperature, I will come to that. You see that here it's uh, already colder than the phase transition temperature, and it's still no uh, topological defects, which is really interesting. So let's go into this. So what we wanted to see is, yeah, how how can we characterize those light, light patches and what do they do? So what I did is basically I created a image processing algorithm, which can capture all the positions, orientations, and uh, the basic parameters of the light patches, and we can uh, we can track them and put some statistics into this. Yeah, my wife wants to show me my baby. Okay, so those this is basically a small cross section of the image. It's a Gaussian profile. We we take the top, we take the area, we describe everything with it, and we put some. Uh, we describe everything in rad radial uh, with radial symmetry. Yeah. So what we did is here is you see these light patches. If you add up thousands and thousands of pictures, you can basically see the line where the isotropic phase, where there is no defects, meets the uh, defect phase. And here in this case, you see that in single image, you see the border is somewhere here. But if you add up so many images, the, also the smaller domains show up and you see that the, this is the real edge. Yeah, so here is the width. This is the um, width of the uh, patches and here is the intensity profile. Uh, intensity profile and intensity times the uh, width of the, yeah. And at this, you see here in the isotropic phase, you have random, random scattered, which are completely un, um, uncorrelated and they are basically just uh, noise. Here at second part, you see already something happening, but it's lower than the diffraction limit of light. But here at the edges, you already can tell about it. You have a normal distribution of uh, pneumatic domains after the, the phase transition. Okay. So what are the open questions here? So everything was basically done in the 90s. They showed light transmission studies, they did some light transmission studies and they tried everything. But what we want to see is what's happening if at extreme temperatures, extreme cooling rates, and what's the temperature? Can you basically map the um, uh, temperature? Uh, yeah, can you map the temperature inside of the liquid crystal? Add the in the in real time in the experiment because you have two thin glass plates of liquid crystal and you cannot just simply stick a thermometer inside it's super small and the process is super fast so what we did 
is basically we took a small laser and we shined it uh, inside of the sample, like this pointer here. We put it here and we measure the temperature we are the simple fact that uh, the um, transmission through the sample changes with biofringence and that biofringence changes with temperature. So this is basically the optical retardation of the sample, which changes with temperature. So we can go, we can heat the sample to the isotropic phase and at the edge start to measure and we measure the temperature. So this gives us the, um, the function at which uh, heat dissipates from the sample. We calculate this at various spots and we can, that's why we can calculate, we make a model and uh, we're in console, mm, which allows us to predict the temperature at any given time at any given location inside of the liquid crystal sample cell. Yeah, okay. So what we did next is basically we, we took different uh, liquid crystals. In our case, one liquid crystal which has a low uh, phase transition temperature and one with a high phase transition temperature. And we heated the sample uh, to 120 degrees. Um, so which is far, far, far above the liquid crystal, uh, liquid, uh, far above both their TCs, the um, phase transition temperatures, and we know how the sample cools. This, the blue line represents the sample cooling. We are at the center of this uh, circle, which I showed you before. So the center point is 102 degrees, and we know that it cools with this function. And we know that at some point we cross the phase transition temperature of uh, for the first liquid crystal and then of the second liquid crystal. And this is the room temperature. But at the same time, we also measure the, the light transmission. So basically we put the photo detector underneath the cell uh, where two cross polarizers don't allow anything uh, to uh, shine through until it's in the pneumatic phase. So we know that here is nothing, nothing, nothing. And at this point at which this line deviates from the uh, from zero, you can say it's the phase transition temperature. It's the, the point at which the matic order informs. So it's the phase transition. Okay. Uh, so yeah, in in this case, E18, the yeah, here it the uh, the system, the um, sample cools in, I think, 0 0.1 millisecond to this temp the phase transition temperature. But the liquid crystal doesn't interact, or basically doesn't become a uh, biofringent um, for 130 microseconds, which is 15 degrees centigrade or Kelvin lower than the phase transition temperature. But as I showed you before, if you have a simple look at the phase transition, uh, uh, you see that the, the liquid crystal can be undercooled only for one Kelvin. So here is, that's a one of the real, uh, one prediction of the um, kibble jurek mechanism because if the system was frozen, we can talk about the, uh, such high temperature drops. In the case of 5CB, the temperature drop is a little bit smaller because it's, uh, it's a two exponent fit. Uh, but it's still 500 microseconds. It needs to cool down. Okay. So I did this for, let me just, yeah, for 5CB. Uh, I went to different initial temperatures and then I measured the times at which I first, I saw the, uh, the I knew the temperature drop. And when I saw the uh, formation of, uh, uh, the formation of um, pneumatic ordering. So a different initial temperature, like for 35 degrees, which is the phase transition temperature, you have immediately the uh, the next phase. But if you go to higher temperature, you need a lot of time. You you don't see anything here. You the temperature is higher than the phase transition temperature. Here you cross the te phase transition temperature, but here only here you see um, pneumatic ordering. So. 
in the case of temperature, here you go, you, you go vice versa. We go to four, from 40 to 25. And here, if you cool down, uh, if you, uh, you're you really slow, you see here from 35, you go, uh, go directly through it. If you go from 110 degrees, you basically see immediately that you have a huge temperature gap, which is quite, uh, no, here it's like three degrees. But in E18, which has a higher phase transition temperature, it, the effect is more pronounced. You see a huge, the area is much bigger, the errors are much smaller, and you can see this patch where without an error, you can say that the liquid crystal is in a supercooled state, which is uh, called a supercooled isotropic state. Okay, so what we can also do is we, we can study the later times of the, um, the later times of the um, sample of the production of topological defects. As I said, we have an isotropic phase inside of the, everything is blue because it's cross polarizers and this is, um, this is ordered, so it's uh, um, black basically, and this is isotropic, and it's also black on the cross polarizers. But I use false false color maps. That's why blue. And after some time, we measure here in the center point. You see that everything happening at the edge. It comes to the middle, and we can see nothing is happening. We cross the phase transition temperature at some point, and then at some point we measure some intensity. And this intensity then increases when the maximum disorder is in place, and then it basically just um, decreases again when the defects annihilate, and you have a, you're left with a vacuum, basically again or ordered liquid crystal. And this effect, this basically timeline of this effect, is also in the, uh, dependent on the thickness of the sample, which was also previously unknown. So, which is a uh, power law time with sample thickness. Okay, so let me conclude if I'm not too fast. I'm sorry if I was too fast. Mm, so I talked about fractal nematic collets, where we show that the geometry of the particles influences the total number of topological defects, but at the same time, the, the total number remains uh, so the number changes, but it always changes in pairs, and the total number is always zero. It, it follows the gauss bonnet theorem, and we, we saw that um, for fractals, the, the number of defect pairs follows the fractal iteration. We are power law. We also saw that uh, we measured dynamic temperature um, inside of thin liquid crystal layers. And in the last part, I showed you how we can basically measure the Hibbel-Jurek mechanism inside of liquid crystal using so, um, rapid cooling and a nanosecond imaging technique. So yeah, thank you for your intention. Uh, I hope you have some questions or if not, it's also okay. Thank you.